I suppose it's time. So, um, so we'll okay. begin. So we are very happy to have uh, uh, Professor Rakesh from University of Delaware, and uh, so he's also one of the co-organizers of this uh, of this ICTS program on inverse problems and related topics. So um, over to you, Professor Rakesh. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming and listening to this talk. And actually all the work of organizing was done by Venki and Divya, she's been working very hard. Thank you. So, um, uh, so I'll be talking about inverse problems for hyperbolic PDEs. And I'll be giving two lectures. So one is starting right now and then one will be after that half an hour after the lecture is over. Okay, so I'm going to, just for the quality of the recording and the voice and stuff, I'm going to stop my video and just uh, share the slides. Um, so hopefully you can hear me clearly and you can all see the slides. Uh, Venki, please let me know if the voice quality is not okay or if there's a problem. Yeah, this so, is fine. That's good. Okay. All right. Thank you. And please feel free to interrupt me if, if you so notice something. All right. So uh, let me first say that, you know, this is a very basic introductory talk. Um, it's uh, directed towards advanced PhD students um, and new, new PhDs who are starting out in inverse problems. It's really directed to people who haven't seen inverse problems much. Um, so if you are, uh, so, so Rakesh, just uh, sorry to interrupt. So you can also turn your video on. We didn't have any issues actually. No, we didn't. Okay, I see. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, and the last slide of my, of my talk will have references to some survey articles and books. Um, I'm sorry to say this, that uh, I have not been uh, very diligent about giving credit to various people for various things in this talk. Uh, the references that I give in that the survey, they have all the references and things. Okay, and I'm sorry, uh, physics is not my strong point, neither am I good at applications. So sometimes if I give some physical explanations, uh, it's just meant to be sort of an overall thing and could be inaccurate. Okay, so I'm going to focus actually just on two, two specific inverse problems for hyperbolic PDEs. And the reason is that both of these problems uh, exemplify in some sense, uh, the two types of, at least the two types of inverse problems one uh, encounters in hyperbolic PDEs. Uh, there are many variations of it, many, much more difficult problems than these, but I think these two problems will give you a good idea of sort of what kind of uh, problems are studied in hyperbolic PTs. Okay, at the end of uh, my talk today, and also uh, the first one and the second one, I will also describe a few of the open problems in this field. So if you're interested in working on some of these problems, you can... Uh, start studying this. And everything I do is for the wave operator or perturbations of it. So I'll use the symbol, uh, the box, uh, the box operator. Uh, I'm looking sideways because my slide is on a different screen. That's why if you see me looking sideways. Okay, so the box operator, which is delta T squared minus Laplacian. So here is a sort of a, my attempt at an explanation of how these inverse problems arise. So let's say, you know, you're looking for oil and you want to drill under the ground. Uh, you want to know whether there's oil underneath you or wherever, right? So one way is of course to drill a hole and check if there is oil there or not, but that's very expensive. And how many holes are you going to drill? So instead one uses uh, cheaper ways of probing what's underneath, right? So I show this uh, little cartoon here. Uh, 
this is uh, actually sort of what geophysicists do. You can see that uh, uh, there is this vibrator here, which sets off an explosion and it sends a sound wave, which goes travels in the interior and uh, the response of the medium comes back and there are all these geophones lined up. And uh, you record what you hear. And on the basis of that, you try to find out what's underneath. And I will tell you a little more about how this sort of helps us find what's underneath and where the oil is. Okay, now instead of sound waves, uh, some companies, for example, Schlumberger, they use uh, oil well logging in which they use electrical currents. Um, and, you know, they send electrical currents and then, you know, they have, again, I said, I don't know what they exactly do, but they measure the response here. And from that, they try to predict, you know, what's underneath. So if you use electrical currents, then the physics is different. And it results in studying some inverse problem for an elliptic PDE. And what you're trying to recover is the conductivity of the medium. Okay, uh, at each point, how well the uh, material conducts electricity. If you send sound waves, uh, that gives rise to hyper hyperbolic PDE inverse problems. And what you're measuring, uh, recovering the sound speed. So you say, how does conductivity or knowing the sound speed in the bottom help me find oil well so for example if you're doing sound speed the sound speed in oil is different from the sound speed in hard rock is different from the sound speed in water and air so if you know what the sound speed is at every point below then you would probably know you know whether there is oil or what kind of geological structure there is same with the conductivity right if you know the conductivity at each point below the earth I mean, I believe conductivity of oil is different from the conductivity of rock and water and so on. So having a conductivity map will tell you what's underneath. Same with the sound speed. So if you do electrical currents and probe the electrical current, that's elliptic PD inverse problems. And that's what you heard the talk by Professor Krishnan on the first day. And if you use sound waves, Okay, and then you're trying to recover, then you're trying to recover sound speed, and these the physics comes uh, generates hyperbolic PD inverse problems, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. That's what I know most about. All right, so so I'm going to talk about hyperbolic uh, uh, P inverse problems. Okay. So this experiment that here, that is sort of, there's a cartoon here. I'm just going to, let me just shift something here. Yeah. Okay. So this is sort of a, a cartoon of um, a slight modification of the problem that I was showing you about the earth. Okay. So let's say, you know, here is this, this is the object. And you can't go inside the object. You're not allowed to drill holes or it's too expensive. And this is the boundary of the object, okay? And you're trying to recover what's inside by sending sound waves from the boundary. So this is your source, excess. This is where you're thumping the ground or something on the surface and it goes and it interacts with the medium. And what you measure is by the receivers, which I'm calling X sub R. Okay, so the source is on the surface, the receivers are on the surface, and the only way you get information about the interior is because the source, the, the sound generated by the source travels in the interior and interacts and then comes back outside. So what you measure is because of what happened in the interior. Okay, so what's the physics? Um, so this is the physics. So I'm going to just make up something here. So Q of X is some function in the interior and it represents your, some acoustic property of the medium. It's not the sound speed because of the model I'm choosing, but just imagine it's some acoustic property. The source is on the excess. That's where you're thumping the ground, making a noise. And the sound goes, interacts with the medium. So it's affected by what Q of X is inside. 
and you measure the response on the receivers on the boundary. So there is an acoustic pressure or the acoustic disturbance at X at time T, which is, so U is the acoustic disturbance at the point X in the interior at time T, corresponding to the source, which was at XS, okay? This is, this is what is the effect. Like you've set off an ex, uh, explosion or a thumping on XS. So it creates a disturbance, X, U is the disturbance. And the, this is the physics. So this disturbance is affected by the physics Q, the, the acoustic property Q through the wave equation. Okay, so this is the connection between the medium and the sound which is, uh, you know, sound which, acoustic sound which, which is sort of traveling around all over here. It's the connection between them is the wave equation. Okay, so U is the solution of this initial boundary value problem. Uh, it's a solution of the wave equation on the domain in space and time, okay? And then how do you model the source? You say the, the you model the source by a boundary condition. So it's a Delta function. The source is, a, there's an explosion at XS at time T equal to zero. So that's what you model by a Delta function. It's a Delta function on the boundary. That's why I put a quotation mark, okay? And before the explosion, which is at time zero, um, Actually, I should do t less than zero here. The, initially, there's nothing happening in the medium. So u is zero and ut is zero. There's no sound here in the medium before the explosion. It should be t less than zero here. Okay, so this is the connection. This is the physics between the connection between the medium property q of x and the sound uh, thumping that you started. Okay, and what are you measuring? So you're measuring this acoustic disturbance U on the receivers, okay? So this is your forward map. If you know your Q, meaning if you knew what the medium was, and if you thump it, I can actually predict what you'll hear in the geophones. It's a well-posed problem. You can do it numerically. There are delta functions here, but there are ways of uh, you know extracting the most singular part. You will see how I do that. Um, so this is a well-posed problem, which means if you know what the medium is, you can, uh, you would know what you would hear on the geophones, okay? But we are interested in the inverse problem, which means I'm giving you, I don't know what the medium is. I don't know what Q is. I don't know what this acoustic property is, what the sound speed is at different points in the interior. I don't, I don't know that. What I have is the response. What is what I have is what I've measured on the boundary. Okay, so that is that receivers and time for where X are, the receiver is on the boundary. And that's what the information I have. And I have it for different source locations. I don't stop here. I thump it here, listen, and I will put a source again, move the source, uh, thump it and then listen, uh, uh, make a noise here, listen, so my source location changes, okay? So I have a lot of information. This is what they do, right? You thump it here and you have geophones here and then you move your thumper. You know, you move it here and then have the geophones. So this is the kind of information that you have, okay? That's UXR, TXS for every source receiver location on the boundary. And you're trying to recover Q. Okay, so that's the problem that I'm interested. In. That's the inverse problem. Okay, so what does it mean to invert functions? Of course, you're trying to find an inverse, all right? But before you know it, can try to find its inverse, you have to study some very basic, even simpler questions. Does it even have an inverse? So the first question really you need to study is, is this map F injective? Is it one-to-one? -one? Will two different cues give rise to different responses on the boundary? If two different mediums give the same response, then you have no hope, or you're not going to recover Q. So that's the first question, which is the injectivity of this map, meaning two, will two different cues give rise to different responses? 
And suppose that is true, then you have a hope of inverting it. But then when you're from a practical point of view, you want to answer the stability question, which is that is it possible that two different cues which are close to each other, as far as you know, if you measure some whatever error norm, will the responses be close to each other? Right, if two different cues give responses which are far apart from each other, two different cues which are close to each other give responses which are far apart, then your numerical scheme is going to behave very badly. Right? What you want, you, what, what you want is to be guaranteed that if the responses are close, then the two mediums must be close to each other in properties, the two cues. Okay, that is very important for inversion. And then once you proved injectivity and stability, then of course, question is, how do you do an inversion, right? And that is also actually, that's a very hard part. Uh, I will uh, explain to you in a minute why, why all these problems are difficult actually for these uh, such questions. Okay, they are different from studying like, you know, some of you have seen the radon transform or the Fourier transform. Uh, and there are inversion formulas for these. For these things, actually, uh, there aren't going to be any inversion formulas. Let's, uh, yeah. okay. So I've, I've, I've just actually reiterated what I said before. You have a medium, a source at excess, and you have receivers all around. Pump it and you measure all around. And the physics here, the connection between Q and whatever you're measuring is through this PDE. And the goal is to study the, in, uh, the injectivity and stability and inversion of F. So first thing you, uh, whenever you study inverse problems, this is what I like to do, is to do what's called a parameter count. And this will give you an idea of whether do you have enough data or not to do the inversion. Okay, it's a very rough calculation, uh, but it, it gives you some idea. So let's look at what we are trying to recover. We are trying to recover Q of X, which is a function, and it's a function in on a domain D and RN, so Q depends on N variables. Okay, what about my data? How many variables does that depend on? So my data is U of XR, it's a function where your receivers are, time, I'm measuring the signal for a certain time period. And also I'm allowed to move my source location on the boundary. So my data is a function of XR, which is on the boundary, T, which where it's a real number and XS, which is on the boundary. So my data depends on XR boundary is an N minus one dimensional object. So that's N minus one for that one for time and n minus one because my sources can be anywhere on the boundary, I move them. So that's n minus one plus one plus n minus one and that's two n minus one variables. So my data depends on n variables, sorry, my unknown function depends on n variables and my data depends on two n minus one variables. Now, so two n minus one is always bigger than n for n greater than one. So that means I have actually a lot of data, what I'd call an overdetermined problem, meaning I have a lot of data, so I should be able to do a good job of trying to recover Q. Notice that when n is equal to one, so Qx, which is n is one, n, and this two n minus one, they are the same. So at least when you have a one dimensional version of this, you know, meaning assuming that your medium was say, spherically symmetric or something like that, or you're doing an earth problem and the, uh, the medium is layered, meaning the Q depends only on depth and not on the horizontal. So that N equals one problem is actually what is called a formally determined problem, meaning the number of parameters of, for Q and the number of parameters for data matches up. So actually in this case, for this problem, the one dimensional problem is harder because there is if you do a count, less data, if you like, in comparison to what the unknown is. The higher dimensional case, uh, 
the problems are more determined, you have more data, at least this particular problem. Uh, if you were at Venki's talk yesterday, you also saw that for the elliptic case, for the elliptic problem, the two dimensional case was in some sense, the hardest one for a similar problem. Higher dimensions were somewhat easier. Okay, and that's just from the parameter count. Okay, so that's one thing. So that's one analysis I also do. And this is for those who've, who are seeing inverse problems for the first time. Uh, one of the difficulties for this reason is that the map F is a nonlinear map, okay? So why is, I mean, you're working with a linear PDE in U, so why is the map F nonlinear, okay? Um, so question is, how does the solution depend on Q? Now notice Q is a coefficient. So the question is, how does the solution U depend on Q? Is that a linear dependence? And you can see that that is a nonlinear dependence in the sense that if you have U1 is the solution for Q1, like for the Q1 problem, suppose the solution is U1, and for the Q2 problem, the solution is U2. Okay, then what is the solution for the Q1 plus Q2 problem? If you put Q1 plus Q2 here in the coefficient, what is the solution? And the answer is it is not U1 plus U2, you can check it. Right, you have box U1 plus Q1, U1 is zero, box U2 plus Q2, U2 is zero. When you add them, you do not get Q1 plus Q2 times U1 plus U2 in that place here. So the solution U is a solution of a linear PD, but its dependence on the coefficient Q is nonlinear. So that's why this map F is actually a nonlinear map. And if you go back, you know, linear maps, for finite dimensional meaning a matrix, you know, studying invertibility is, you know, okay, check determinant or something. But even for nonlinear maps, even from Rn to Rn, checking whether it's injective or something is a very difficult question. Okay, if you go back and think there are very few results which tell us about the injectivity of nonlinear maps, even from Rn to Rn, right? And this F is a nonlinear map and this is not on Rn, this is actually on function. So F is, the domain of F is actually in some function space. So it's be even harder. So that's why these uh, questions are difficult. You're trying to study the injectivity, the invertibility of nonlinear maps on function spaces. And there is no explicit formula for F. It's not as if I can write on OU is some sort of integral of Q. No, there isn't. Uh, the connection between U and Q is very complicated. It's indirect, right? The connection is that U is a solution of this PDE. And this is a nonlinear, this is a PDE with non-constant coefficient. There are no explicit formulas here. There is no explicit formula for U in terms of Q. The connection is complicated through a PDE. So it's F is a nonlinear map and the connection between Q and U is complicated. So trying to invert it is, a uh, non-trivial problem, all right? So those of you who've seen inverse problems know all this very well, but if you're seeing it for the first time, uh, that, that's an important point to note. So there is no simple formula connecting U to Q, not like a radon transform or a Fourier transform or some other transform, all right? The connection between U and Q is complicated and F is a nonlinear map, okay. So, okay, again, so I've reiterated that because I'm going to try to modify how I, so I'm going to show you how this problem is solved, but I have to modify the way the problem is stated. So U is the solution of uh, this wave equation and you're, allow, you're putting a source here on the boundary and receivers everywhere, right? And the goal is to invert this. Okay, so this is a, not a very subtle point, but still it's worth explaining. So you're allowed to put any source, a source anywhere on the boundary, right? So now, but, and you're allowed to move it. Now, if you have a function f on the boundary, right? Then you can write this function f in terms of, uh, 
linear combination of a source here by some amplitude, linear combination of source here by amplitude, source here. And what I mean by linear combination, what I mean is that you can do an integral. So any function f on the boundary can be written as a convolution of all these delta functions. So if you know the medium response for every possible source location on the boundary, and you know it separately, then basically what you do is you know the medium response for any function f on the boundary. Okay, because any function f can be written as a convolution of, well, basically f and the delta function. Okay, so if you know the medium response for every source location on the boundary, then you basically know the medium response for any function on the boundary. Okay, uh, but now my function also can also depend on time and well, you say, how can I get the function at a different time, a source at a different time? Well, what you do is, because the medium is independent of time, whether you put at source at time t equal to zero, or you put the source at time t equals one, uh, the response will be the same, just shifted by time. So you can actually move the source here, not at just time t equal to zero, but move it up at time different times. So, if you think about it a little, you can see that you can take a source to be any function on the boundary in space and time. And knowing this map F is the same thing as knowing the response of the medium to every boundary source F, not just point sources. Okay, uh, you can think about it and come back to it, but the point is this, any source can be made up of a combination of these point sources. So what you have is another formulation of this problem is that you have the medium response measured on the receiver locations to every possible source, uh, source function on the boundary, okay? Not just the point sources. So here is a new formulation of the problem. So pick an arbitrary source on the boundary and let uxd be the solution of this initial boundary value problem. This is the response of the medium. So, but instead of a boundary source here, F, a uh, delta thing, I have an F here. So you put a source F on the boundary and initially the medium is quiet and then the medium responds. And since you have the information for every possible source F, what we have is, so I define this map called the Dirichlet Neumann map. Give me the source F and measure the response on the boundary. Okay, and this is the response, it's the Neumann derivative. So the source is the, the U and the response is the Neumann derivative measured on the boundary. Okay, so what lambda Q is the, is the response in operator. You give me the F, what the source is, and then the response. So this, having this information, this U X R T X S, is equivalent to having this operator lambda q. Okay, so your data is this operator lambda q, which is the response you measure for every source f. So this is the lambda q is the data, and this lambda q is called the Dirichlet Neumann map. Okay, if you were in Venki's talk, there was a corresponding thing, but here it was an elliptic operator, Laplace in u, and it was just on d. Okay. So what is the goal? So lambda Q is the response operator. You give me any response, I'll tell, you know, give me any source, I know the response. So this is the forward map. If you know Q, you can solve this problem. So you get this. And my goal is to invert this. If I give you the response operator, can you find Q? So we talked about this, F is an, this is an overdetermined problem, meaning there's a lot of data, so it should not be as difficult as the problem which I talked in the second lecture, where the amount of data is much less. We'll see that later. And we know F is a nonlinear map, so we'll be, have problems. So you want to invert it. And the first question is, is the map F injective? Okay, and that's the very first question, which means if the medium response from two different cues 
are the same? Does it imply that the two Qs must be the same? Okay, so that's the first, uh, that's the question that I'm going to address in this talk here. Okay, so amongst the various inverse problems, actually, this is perhaps in some sense the easiest one to uh, show. Um, other, th other things get more complicated. So, so that's what I'm going to show you that lambda q, one equals qt implies q and q2. And let's just, if you're seeing this for the first time, you know, there's a lot of symbols going around here. So just let me remind you again of what lambda q is. So you take a source f on the boundary and uh, you solve this initial boundary value problem. This is a well-posed problem. Okay, and so given the source f, the boundary for source f, you measure the response, which is the normal derivative on the boundary only. Okay, so lambda q is the response operator. So given lambda q, which is the response of the medium to every boundary input, can we determine q? Okay, so this is the question we're going to study. Suppose Q1 and Q functions are two mediums or two functions on D. If the response operators are the, the response is the same for every source F on the boundary. For every source F on the boundary, the response is the same on the boundary. Show that Q1 is equal to Q2. So, well, what is the response, right? So you put a source F, so, and you know, you have Q1 and Q2, so UIF. So I'm, I am equals one into one corresponds to Q1 and two corresponds to Q2. And F means this is the solution corresponding to the source F. Okay, so that's why I've indexed it, UIF. U1 is the solution corresponding to the medium one, U2 is the solution corresponding to medium two, both with the same source F. Okay, and we are given that the normal derivatives, the what you measure on the boundary are the same. And this is the same, no matter what source F you use on the boundary, that is what we are given. And we have to show that Q1 is equal to Q2, right? So I hope uh, this is not too much, too cumbersome a notation with the F dependence. F means, you know, your solution depends on what source you're using. And I one, two means which medium you're working for. Okay, so the medium response for Q1 and Q2 is the same for every source F. And we want to show that the two mediums are the same. So how do we show this? Okay, so this is typically what we do for these inverse problems. Whenever you have two things you know, you want and something is the same and you want to show they are the same, you just look at the difference. And so you study the difference. So you have U1 satisfies this PDE, U2 satisfies this PDE. So you take the difference of the two PDEs. So V sub F is the difference of U1 F minus U2 F. So if you do a little algebra and you take the difference of the two, you get this first PDE for V. So this is Q1 not Q1 minus Q2, all right? And this is the VF, which is the difference. And notice the difference of the two Qs comes up here. This is what we want to show to be zero, Q1 equals Q2. And times some U2F, which is a solution of this PDE. Okay, now if you take the difference of the boundary condition here, so you get the difference in the boundary is zero. And initially also, initial data is zero, so the difference is zero. So if you look at the difference of the two solutions, that satisfies this PDE, okay? And also, so what are we given? We are given that the two solutions for all the sources F agree on the boundary. So what about the difference? So that means the difference, the normal derivative is zero on the boundary. So I should have put on the boundary here. Uh, for every source F. So you have this VF, which is a solution of this PDE, and VF is zero on the boundary, and its normal derivative is also zero on the boundary. And from that, we want to show that Q1 is equal to Q2. 
All right, I'm just going to, I think in the next slide, I repeat this question. So that is really what we have to do. So we want to show that Q1 is equal to Q2. And what is the information that we have? We have V of F is the solution of this PDE. VF is zero on the boundary, VF is zero initially. This is where Q1 minus Q2 shows up. And we have the additional information that the normal derivative of VF on the boundary is zero. Because of this, we want to show, this is what will help us give Q1 is equal to Q2. Okay, so I'm going to put this here, just look at this. I'm going to put the information here so we have V is zero initially, VF. VF is zero on the boundary. The normal derivative is zero on the boundary. Okay, and V of F satisfies this system. Please ignore this second picture for the moment. Okay, so V is zero initially, V is zero on the boundary, and VF satisfies this thing. For every F, uh, there's a U2F here. And just from that, I want to show that Q1 equals Q2, right? So V initially zero and the Cauchy data on the boundary is zero. And just from that, I want to show that this must be zero. There is no choice. The only thing going for us is that this function U2F is there. And I have this U2F for every F. We'll come back to this in a minute. Okay, so I have a lot of information. I have this for every F. And U2F is the solution of the PD. So how do we do this? Um, so the way, how do you show Q1 equals Q? The way one goes about doing it is derive this thing called the Alessandrini identity, which is as follows. So you pick any function W, which satisfies the same the same operator here, but on the right-hand side, it is zero. Okay, instead of this thing here, it's zero. And the second thing is, I don't care what the boundary value is. You can make it anything on the boundary. Second important thing is W is zero at T equal to T. W and WT are zero here. All right. So W and WT are zero, and I'm going to actually take a combination of these two functions, okay? So U, V is zero here at T equal to zero. V is in V normal derivative was zero on the boundary, okay? And V F solved this, and I just take any function, any function W, which is a solution of this problem, okay? And you can impose any boundary condition you like to solve this problem. And we get this identity here. I hope you can see the bottom of the slide here. Okay, uh, it's a little dense slide. So let's just go over this quickly. Uh, quickly, I mean carefully. So just for omega here is this cylinder, D cross zero T. So I'm doing an integration on this whole cylinder. Okay, and what I'm integrating, I'm taking this right-hand side here of this PDE and multiplying it by this function w. I'm just looking at the integral. You say y, you will see in a second y. Okay, so I take the right side of this PDE and this w here, which I've constructed arbitrary, which solves this, and multiply them and integrate them. Okay, now this is the right-hand side of the PDE, this q2 minus q1 u2f. So I just replace that by box plus Q1 times VF, and then the W is there. Okay, and the integration is on the cylinder. So now you do the standard trick, which is to integration by parts, which means you throw the operator box plus Q1 onto W. Okay, so you do integration by parts, or you know if you like uh, Gauss's theorem, uh, the divergence theorem and so on. So you put it on the other side, you get that term, okay? But when you do that, of course, you will get boundary terms. But my point is that the boundary terms are all going to be zero. So let's see why, right? So you'll get a term on the boundary at t equal to zero, but there V and VF are both zero, okay? 
and you'll get something from u, but they'll all be multiplied by the v and the time derivative v. So there'll be nothing coming from here. Okay, now you'll be a boundary term coming from t equals t, which will be a multiplication of you know v and vf and w, but w is zero on t equals t. That's why I chose it like that. So w is zero t equal t and v is zero here, v and vt are zero. So you will not get any boundary terms from the top and the bottom when you do this integration by parts. What about the lateral boundary? Well, the lateral boundary, the V is zero and the normal derivative of V is zero. So it doesn't matter what v, W is here on the lateral boundary, they'll all be multiplied by this. So you will not get any term on the lateral boundary. The delta on the boundary of that, you'll all get zero here, okay? But what about w, uh, box plus Q1W? Well, that I chose to be zero. That's how I chose my W. So this whole thing is zero. Okay, which means that this integral is zero for every function w, which, satis which is a solution of this equation and w, w, t is zero. Okay, and times u2f, where u2f is this, the medium corresponding to an arbitrary source f. Okay, so this is the important identity. This is what is going to crack open the problem. This is what will help me get my hands on Q1, Q2 minus Q1. The integral of Q2 minus Q1, which is purely a function of X, times an arbitrary function W, which satisfies this wave equation, times a function U to F, which is a solution of another wave equation, which I'll write down in a second. This product is always zero for arbitrary f and arbitrary w. So the whole trick is to just choose rich enough families of u2, f and w so that we get a lot, all the information about q2 minus q1. That is the trick, okay? That you will choose a large, some family of w's and some families of u2, f for different f's. And Basically, you will be able to extract all the information about Q2 minus Q1. That's really the trick. So this identity is very elementary, but an important step. So let's uh, go and I'll re I will say this again. So we have to show Q1, Q2, where this integral is zero for all F and all W, which satisfies this property. So here is the restatement of the problem, okay? So I have this Q1 minus Q2 times U times W is zero on the cylinder where what are U and W? U and W both, this was, U was U2 F. So U, okay, actually this should be Q2 here, not Q1, but anyway. Yeah, sorry, uh, it's, uh, yeah, this should be Q2 or up Q1, sorry. So, but doesn't matter. So U is the solution of the wave equation. W is the solution of the wave equation on D cross zero T. Only difference between U and W is, of course, apart from Q1 and Q2, that U is zero here and W is zero on the top. And U can be anything, any F on the boundary. That's why I did not even write it. Okay, so this, this picture here tells you everything. U is zero initially, W is zero at final time. U is the solution of a wave equation, this should be Q2. And W is the solution of the wave equation on that. And U and W can be arbitrary functions on the boundary. And for such U and W, this integral is zero. Sorry, this integral here. For arbitrary u and w, which are satisfying this condition in this picture. So the goal is just pick a rich enough collection of u's and w's so that this product, if you like, if you like, is it sort of gives you a density kind of thing on this. Okay. There is one thing here which it's not u times w is not going to be dense on d cross zero t. The reason we don't need that is because q1 minus qt is only a function of x. 
Q1 minus Q2 does not depend on T. Okay, whereas the integration is on the whole thing. So you don't need U times W to be dense on the cylinder. You need it to be dense on a smaller set. Okay, so how does this work? So what find family of U and Ws we choose? Okay, so what we do is we try to find the U and Ws, which are solutions which are concentrated on a 45 degree line. These are rays for the wave equation. By the way, whatever I've done so far, nowhere did I use anything specific, sorry. Nowhere, nowhere have I done anything which is specific to the wave equation, apart from the fact that it's time. Okay, this is the first place where I'm going to start using the fact that I'm working actually with the wave operator. And for wave operators, lines with 45 degrees, you know, to the vertical, this is time and this is space, they are rays. Okay, and for rays, for the wave operator, you can find solutions which are like the principal part is concentrated on lines of 45 degrees. And why this very specific line? Okay, so notice that if the solution is concentrated on this line, then at time t equals t, notice that it does not hit the cylinder top. So that means the solution will be zero here, w and wt. And if the solution is concentrated on this line here, which means that solution support is here, which means the u will be zero and ut will be zero here. That's why I'm doing this 45 degree line which does not hit the top and does not hit the bottom. Okay, now for that to happen, uh, you need your time to be large enough. Your cylinder has to be high enough. If the cylinder was very low, this 45 degree line will always hit the top or you know, you'll have to start at the bottom. So this time T has to be greater than the diameter of the domain. Okay, then and only then can you do this, what I'm trying to do. So which means for this uniqueness, this T has to be greater than the diameter. Okay, so let me be more specific. How do we construct these solutions? Okay, now this is a very busy slide. So let's, uh, okay, uh, let's go over this slowly. So what you do is uh, you pick a unit vector direction omega. This is the direction in which this 45 degree line is going. This is vertical, but horizontal direction is omega. Okay, sigma is positive and we will choose a smooth function chi on Rn, which is supported outside D. And then when you shift it in the direction omega by capital T, its support should also again be outside T. Okay, and then we are going to build solutions U and W, which are of this very special form. Notice that E i sigma x dot omega plus T, chi x plus T omega plus a remainder. Okay, and this U is going to be supported here initially. And W is the same thing, except that it's minus I omega and that. And the remainders, and this is because it's the wave equation. So these plane waves are solutions of the standard wave equation, but you have Q1 and Q, well, Q2 and Q1. And for that, because of that, you need the remainder. And you can prove that the remainder will behave like L2 norm will behave like one over sigma. Okay, so these are the special U and W that I need to construct. Okay, and this is where the fact that it's the wave operator here, that plays a role. Okay, how you construct this and why it is true, uh, I'll give a reference for that. Okay, so how do we use this? Okay, so let me just go back here. Okay, yeah, in fact, this summarizes it, okay? So I'm given that this integral is zero for all solutions of those things, and we construct these very special solutions. So U is of this type, and W is of this type, and the remainders are small for large sake. Okay, I'll take five minutes more and then I'll stop. Okay, so what happens when you do U times W? So notice that these two things cancel out. So you're just left with chi square 
And then you'll have terms with the remainder. Now the remainders are like one over sigma for large sigma. So what you get is this. So you get the term first term by multiplying this chi squared x plus t omega times q and minus q integrated over the cylinder plus terms of the type of order one over sigma for large sigma. And then notice this is zero, so this is zero. Okay, so this is what I meant by choosing a rich enough family of u and w. So you've chosen that and you get this. So you let sigma go to infinity and you get this integral is zero. And this is true, you can do this. I'm going through a little fast here. For every smooth function chi of x, where chi x and this are supported outside t. Okay, so this is just taking that and multiplying. These two cancel out. And you're left with chi square and everything else is of order one over sigma. So how does that help us prove q2 and minus q2 is zero, right? So for any Q which chi, which is supported here and you shift it supported there, I have this as zero. Well, if you just rewrite this a little, this is zero and you shift. And basically what you get is that chi square X for any chi X times this X-ray transform. This is the integral of Q2 minus Q1 on this line times chi squared x. It's true for any chi which is supported here and it's translated supported here. Okay, and this is it then. So by choosing the different chi's, what you get is that this integral must be zero for every line going through D. Basically, that's what you can argue from this. So the integral of Q2 minus Q1 is zero for every line going through D. And from this, we can conclude, once you know the X-ray transform is zero on every line, then the function is zero. That is something like what you do for the radon transform and so on. Okay, so I went through this part a little fast. Uh, okay, I, I don't have time to talk about the open problems. Um, but you can talk of the open problems with a system. You know, you instead of a function Q, you put a matrix Q. And uh, you can have ones with uh, two different sound speeds. And this is much harder problem in this. Uh, there's a lot of work done by Belishev and Professor Ismailov, who's listening to this talk. He's also done work on not this problem, but a one dimensional version of this. But uh, anyway. So I don't have time, I'll stop here. And uh, the slides will have all these references. Okay, and so you can look at the references later. Thank you. Thanks Rakesh. Uh, any questions? So, uh, so Rakesh, I have a question. So, uh, the the open problem that you mentioned with Kurilev and the Petronin and uh, they solved, right? The, the uh, one the, for the matrix. Yeah, I actually. Yeah, I well, I asked him. Uh, I asked uh, Oksana and Laurie about this problem where there is a potential with matrix. So, what he said is that when Q is symmetric, it was solved. Uh, Two thousand eighteen. Uh, the general Q case is open, but he said he has a student working on it and he thinks he's close to finishing it. I see. Okay. So, but actually this, uh, this two velocity problem, you know, notice that, so it's a matrix Q is here, A, B, C, but there are two different velocities. So this is the box operator is a velocity one, this is velocity two. These problems are completely open. Um, it's uh, the 1D problem was actually, you know, studied by Belishev and Professor Ismailov has worked on it. Uh, and already that is very difficult. Uh, and the 2D problem, I mean, the higher dimension problem, you know, there are these elasticity and things like that. They're all very difficult. So the two velocity problems are really completely open. Anyone who wants to try their hand. Uh, so, so what do you mean by uh, box two then? So it's a, you know, so, so box is one over uh, delta T squared minus Laplacian. And box C is one over C squared delta T squared. 
So instead of, you know, so when C is one, you get the standard wave operator. When C is two, one over C squared delta T squared. Uh, am I clear about that, Venki, or not? Yes, yes, I understood now. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the box two is the one over two squared delta T squared. So sound speed is two for this. Sound speed is one for that. But they are interacting through A, B, C, D. And you can you know, put uh, arbitrary boundary and stay into the same Dirichlet Neumann map. And the goal is to recover these four coefficients, so the matrix. This is, uh, these problems are very difficult. I've worked on it also. And Belishev has done very important work about this. And uh, Professor Ismailov, he's in the, he's listening, he's done some work for first order systems for this. Uh, but these are very difficult problems. Even in one dimension, higher dimension also, you know, there comes with equations of elasticity, uh, they're difficult. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned actually, uh, which are these velocity recovery problems. Uh, I was always trying to recover in zeroth order coefficient. The velocity recovery problems are very hard. And there you need a different technique called the boundary control method. Uh, that's what I was talking about here. Uh, it's a very different, different, very powerful and different approach. Um, and you can find that. Anyway, uh, that's all I want to say about this. Hello. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you one question, Professor? Yeah, can, sorry, can you, I'm trying to find... To the, yeah. Who is it though? Hello. Tell me your name. I'm Manmohan. Manmohan. Oh, Manmohan. Hi, Manmohan. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, tell yeah, me where you are. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. This professor. Yeah, so... This one? This slide? Yeah, yeah this one. Yeah, yeah, this slide. Okay. There it is. Excellent. So, you know, so this so, is... So IK. this... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this IK is the identity matrix, right? Correct, right. Yeah, so, you know, you yeah. have the wave operator on the diagonal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, so it's it's really this here. It's like this. If you did two by two system, so it would be box U plus this instead of box two mm U. -hmm. Yeah. Actually, that problem we studied me and Rohit Kumar Mishra. This one. One of the former students. Yeah. 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 I see. Okay. With, even with the time dependent case and in the partial data set. I see. And uh, so, what is the answer? You have the answer for this for yeah. All yeah. We, yeah, we could recover two, even anti-symmetricals. I see. I okay. mean, and without symmetry assumption. Oh, I see. Yeah. So yeah. actually, yes. uh, uh, maybe you should talk to Oksan and then send him, send me the first thing yeah. and then I, you know, I will tell you if there's yeah, yeah. a difference. Okay, yeah. let me know. Yeah, actually we have we have discussed with Oksan and also. And I see. We, are, we are extending some other work on led to this actually currently. I see, because yeah. I we are in touch just, with. I yeah, asked him we two are days also ago. In, yeah, okay. That's what Excellent. he told We are me. also touch, in touch with him. I see, okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, send, yeah, yeah, show yeah. me the, or send me the references and I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I'll, curious. I'll send yeah. Okay. okay. I'll send Thank, it. Thanks, okay. Manmohan. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All right. Oh, I see. Tuhin is also listening here. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, so um, Venki, you can stop anytime you wish that. Yeah, if no more questions, we will stop. It's, uh, it's going to be seven. So we will uh, um, get back in about uh, in 31 minutes. Seven, right. seven, uh, sorry. I'm sorry, you know, it's different time zones. I should not say time in, in about half an hour from now. Correct. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rakesh. Okay. Bye-bye.